68. Nuts are 148. Believe it or not, if you take the gematria of Haredi, Haredi, you end up with 217. And we know that in gematria, one doesn't make any difference. In Hakoyo, counting the, the word together. So, Dita Nasha is the day of the record, the day that we all attribute to the record. It's not just the Dan Nasha. It's not just the Dan Nasha. Why? Because if what you also do is you take the gematria of Sparin. What is the gematria of Sparin? The gematria of Sparin, Sama for 16, Pei for 80, Rach for 200, Yud for 10, Mem for 40. You come up with 390. 390. What is, happens with Sparin if you have Siata Dishmaya, if you have the help of the Rabbana Shalom? If you have Yud K Vav K added to 390, it comes out to be 416. And those of you who wanted to be interested in gematria would figure out that 416 is the gematria of K Tevis. K Tevis. Sparring with Yud K Vav K equals 416. But that's just to start off with what speakers consider kind of a joke at the outset. The real lesson, it seems to me, in terms of the Dun Nutsak and Hey Tevez, is that we manage to persuade a non Jewish judge of the rightness and the correctness of Chabad's view and the Rebbe's view. Where is there a similarity that's currently appropriate? Just look at this week's Sefer. Yehuda stands up before what he thinks is a Gaius should judge. He thinks Yosef is a Mitzri, right? And he makes this incredible speech, this incredible lawyer's argument on behalf of Binyamin and succeeds. Not because he manages to persuade this mystery that Binyamin is innocent, but because his words are authentic and heartfelt. My own yikas is that my grandfather, the Raisha Rav, Rav Aaron Levine, who was the Rav in Russia, in Poland, in pre-war Poland, in Galicia, was elected to the Polish Senate, wrote, was a magnificent Talmud Chacham, wrote Shuvas and Sparin, Sefer on Torah, Adras Ro'ilim. He talks about the Pasuk in this week's Sedra, where Yehuda says to Yosef, I want to speak in your ear. And he says, what is the meaning of that? And he explains, the Raisharov explains in this marvelous cipher that he wrote, according to the introduction, on the train rides that he took from Russia to Warsaw to be in the Polish Seng and the Polish government paid first-class carriage for him to travel every week. He would go on Tuesday, on Monday or Tuesday to Warsaw, and come back on Thursday from the same. And in this Sefer he says, that what Yehuda was saying to, to Yosef came to Barim Hayotzim in Ale. And he knew that even if this was an Egyptian ruler, Dvarim Hayotzim in Ale, Mechnasim in Ale. 
The story and the account of this amazing victory of the Dunnutzak has so many facets to it, so many interesting sidelights, so many interesting details. Not all of them are known, even though recently a very fine book was put out about the Rebbe by Joseph Polushkin, which discussed in detail some parts regarding the trial after we had spoken with him. There were some things, I mean, with this audience, I can share one amazing episode, really, which I think this audience particularly would appreciate. The, you follow, if you follow the account of the case, the issue was, of course, whether this marvelous library of Sparin belonged to the family, to Gurari, in the Harari family in part, or to Agudas Hasideh Chava. That was the issue in the case. We were litigating. We were in the middle of the court trial when my opposing counsel one day stood up and said to the court, Your Honor, we'd like to put on a witness out of order. Flying here today in the air because he only has a few days available, is the leading professor of Jewish law at Hebrew University, a man by the name of Shmuel Shiloh. And he has to testify. The only time he can testify is tomorrow. We're sorry we couldn't advise the lawyer, Mr. Lewin, about him testifying, but he's here to testify tomorrow on a point of Jewish law. What's the point of Jewish law? So Mr. Hellerstein says, I will give Mr. Lewin a summary of Professor Shiloh's testimony. What is his testimony? His testimony is that the Freer Dicker Rebbe could not have transferred ownership of this library of books to Agudas Hasidei Chabad because there was no Kenya. There was not a Kenya Klippin. There was no Kenyan under Jewish law. And therefore, says Mr. Hellerstein, under Jewish law, there was no transfer of ownership of this library. Professor Shilo will show up tomorrow. The judge says, well, we don't have a choice. All right, Professor Shilo will testify tomorrow. So I go home. What am I going to do in terms of cross-examining this great expert on Jewish law about the fact that there was no Kenya? It turns out, by the way, and I knew it when he, it was announced, that Shmuel Shiloh was a nice American yeshiva boy. He had gone to high school and was in my high school class. Before his name was Shmuel Shiloh, it was Stanley Schimmel. But he went on the yacht, one of the first members of our class, to his credit, a very fine man, one of the first members of our class to go on the yacht, and he changed his name to Shmuel Shiloh. And he learned Jewish mishpat degree at Hebrew University under Menachem Elon, who was a great, was a Talmud Kakam, a marvelous man, professor at Hebrew University and ultimately on the Supreme Court of Israel. Shmuel Shiloh was his Talmud Muva, and he became the leading expert on mishpat degree at Hebrew University. And he was going to show up the next day to testify according to this summary, that there was no Kenya. But what maybe Shmuel Shiloh had forgotten was that we learned in the yeshiva together. And I maybe was even in a higher shear than he was. So I knew a little bit, not so much, but a little bit. Enough that the next day when Shmuel Shiloh got on the witness stand and testified that there, could have, there was no Kenyan, therefore the Rebbe could not have transferred the ownership of these Sfarim under Jewish law to Agudas Kassid Echabad. I said to him, isn't it true, Professor Shiloh, this is part of the cross-examination, isn't it true that Amira Lagavoa can Sira Lahedio Dung? He said, oh, that's right. I said, and isn't a community like Chabad considered for purposes of halakha, like a hektish, like a amirah And 
This was a marvelous occasion, which I seldom get on cross-examination, <laughs> where a witness says, you know, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that Judge Sifton ruled as a matter of halakha that you didn't need a Kenyan because Amira the Gavoa can see all the head you dummy. But Judge Sifton did not pay much attention to the Jewish law questions. He decided this case as a matter of American law and New York law and ignored really the Jewish law parts of it. But to me personally, I have to tell you, this was a high point of the trial because it enabled me to use some abilities that most lawyers in America don't have, including even speaking Yiddish and understanding Yiddish. A good number of the witnesses who testified in this case claimed that they only knew Yiddish, particularly Chaim Lieberman, who was a chief opponent of ours and testified on behalf of Gorari that it belonged to the Gorari family. So he said he understood no English, and we had to in have an interpreter at the trial who sat, stood there, and as Lieberman gave his testimony, he would be interpreted, my questions would go from English into Yiddish, his answers would go from Yiddish into English, and I can only tell you that was very difficult for a trial lawyer. My experience as a trial lawyer is answer question, answer, next question. Immediately after the witness gives his answer, you want to ask the next question. And there were many times during the trial, I, since I understood what Lieberman was saying, that I would say, he would answer in Yiddish, and I would immediately ask the next question in English, and Judge Sifton would say, Mr. Lewin, slow down, slow down. I don't know what the witness said. You have to wait for the interpreter. That was one of the difficulties in this trial, was the translations from Yiddish into English. And, and yet, Judge Sifton accepted the testimony and was impressed, of course, as everybody knows in these accounts, by the deposition testimony of the Rebbitson. Well, I have to tell you, we told the Rebbitson, Allah Shalom, that what she should do is, during this deposition, wait. She say that she does not understand English so well, we'll have an interpreter there, and every time the question is asked, it'll have to be in, uh, interpreted into Yiddish, she can give her answer in Yiddish, It'll be translated into English. That's going to slow everything down. She can think about the answers. There's no problem. But the Rebbitson, amazingly, although we had told her that, after three or four questions, ah, forget about the interpreter. The questions were asked in English, and she answered them in English. Just like that. Not trying to slow down the process. And of course, the famous, famous, famous answer that she gave at the very end of her deposition testimony, my father and the Sfarim belong to the Hasidim. That was an amazing answer. And I have to tell you, truthfully, I wish I could take credit for it. I didn't prepare her to say that. But she sat there and in answer to the question of what did your father have, she said, Talos and Philan. Nothing else? And she said, no. My father and the Sfarim belonged to the Hasidim. That was very moving testimony. And of course, we had phenomenal witnesses who agreed to testify for us. Nobel Prize winner, Elie Wiesel, great scholars in, in Halakha, in Jewish thought, who testified that Chabad, Lubavitch Rebbe's do not gather wealth like other Rebbe's do and try to own things personally. The case provided an opportunity for me to meet twice with the Rebbe. And I have to tell you that very foolishly, I did not, when I walked out of those two meetings, immediately get a tape recorder and repeat the whole conversation, because a major subject 
that I am questioned about all over the world, all over the world, is you had meetings with the Rebbe? Tell me exactly what the Rebbe said to you and what you said to the Rebbe. And my memory is not good enough to tell everything. It was amazing, the very first meeting we had, the Rebbe said, what language should we speak? And I said, ek fashtay Yiddish, mamagen Yiddish. But Mr. Shestak, who was my co-counsel, said, no, I don't speak Yiddish. So the Rebbe spoke in English for the rest of that meeting and the following meeting. And the English was crystal clear and beautiful. Um, the the uh, meetings were such that it indicated to me clearly that he knew every detail of the proceeding. He had read the transcripts and knew them and was able to point to different things in hearings that we had had before the court. It's important to emphasize, and I do it here again, although I've said it in various other forums which are not as friendly as this forum is, because I'm frequently asked, oh, Chabad won this case about the Sephardim in a secular court. Why didn't Lubavitch bring this case to a bestie? After all, if the books were taken, it was, and the other person is Jewish, you should go to a bestie. And the answer is, we did, we wanted to go to a bestie. But what happened was that Barry Murari had taken out surreptitiously, in the middle of the night, 400 valuable books, and made a list of them, a manuscript, was selling them in Europe and in Israel. And many of them were sold. Chabad ultimately had to buy many of them back from the people who purchased them, and was in the process of selling them. So the first thing that had to be done was to stop him from selling and force him to put the books into what the lawyers called escrow, into a safe place where they would be kept. The first meeting I had with Rabbi Krinsky, Rabbi Krinsky called me, believe it or not, at two in the morning. I and my wife still remember that phone call at two in the morning. And he has said since then that he did it without the Rebbe's authorization. He saw how upset the Rebbe was over the taking of the Sparin and how he had talked to Fabrengans about it. And he felt he had to do what he could to cure that situation. So he called me at 2 in the morning. And we arranged a meeting. And he brought to the meeting a page from the Koshen Mishpat, which talks about the fact that you can go to our courts, you can go to a secular court, if you can't get the relief that you need from a bezdin, either because the other party won't listen to a bezdin, or for some other reason the bezdin can't give you that relief. So what we wanted is we wanted the books taken and put into a safe place and an order under which Barry could not sell them. We agreed that I would draft up the papers to get that relief, to get what the lawyers call a temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction to get that. And I went down to the courthouse and we filed the papers. And when you file a complaint in federal court, the clerk puts his hand in the wheel, pulls out a name, and he pulled out the name Charles Sifton to be the judge. It was August. Charles, judge Charles Sifton was away on vacation, but we needed an immediate order. Mr. Uh, Barry Garari was there, his lawyer was there, we were ready to go to a judge. So there's another judge who takes the place of a judge who happens to be away on vacation. The judge who we were told to go see was a judge by the name of Leo Glasser. G-L-A-S-S-E-R, obviously Jewish. And he would rule on this question of the temporary restraining order or the preliminary injunction. So we all marched over to Judge Glasser's chambers. We walked in the door, and I was delighted to see as I, we walked in the door, in the, in the hall, as one walked in to his chambers, was a first page of a Rambach printed in 
the 1600s in a frame. So obviously he had some Jewish feeling. We sat down with Judge Glasser, he looked at the papers, and one of his first questions was, why isn't this case in a rabbinic court? And I replied and said, we want to go to a rabbinic court after we get an order that says that he can't sell the books and put the books in, into escrow. Then, if we get that order, we're ready to find, try to find a best to resolve who owns the library. And his lawyer, Mr. Hellerstein, said in his presence, oh no, your honor, we don't agree. We think that once the case is brought, the court should decide who owns the library. And he said, his mother is going to come into the case on his side because she also thinks that the family owns the library. Well, under those circumstances, there was nothing we could do. The judge said, all right, I'll hear the, or Judge Sifton will hear the whole case. And he gave us an order that put the books into escrow and that directed Barry that he could not sell any of those that he had had but would have to turn them over. So in fact, if anybody says to you, as many people have said to me, this case should have gone to a Besson, the answer is we told that to the judge at the very first appearance in court, that we are going to a Besson if the order is given that he may not sell the books. The, so many things about the case were really quite amazing. So much of it shows Siata de Shmaya, not only the question of Professor Shilo and the question of the uh, Kenyan, but for example, Chaim Lieberman testifies. Chaim Lieberman said that the books belonged to Burari. He said that the books were, the library was a private library. Well, we discovered that after the Freer de Zarebi was nifter, after he passed away, Chaim Lieberman continued to buy books for the library from organizations like the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization, which had gotten books from the Shoah that were brought over to America and were being sold at five cents a safer or a volume. And Lieberman had ordered books for this library after the Rebbe had passed away at five cents a book, saying that they were being bought for the Lubavitch Library. And there were copies of his letters that he had in his apartment. In those days, they were carbon copies. I don't, many of you here probably remember carbon copies with carbon paper, not like today, when it, that doesn't exist anymore, everything can be done with a copying machine. But in those days, they were thin carbon copies. And we served a subpoena on Chaim Liebman to produce all the documents he had that related to the library. When it turned out that Chaim Liebman in his apartment, he was a bucker, he never got married, he lived in an apartment, Lubavitch had given him a couple of buckram who were going to help him take care of his daily needs because he was over 90 years old already at the time. And he lived in this apartment and he had papers, he had documents there. And it turned out that the buckram found and sent to me torn up carbon copy of a letter that was sent to the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization two years after the previous Rebbe had passed away, asking for books at five cents for the Lubavitch Library. Now that was good evidence that Lieberman, at that time, thought this was a community library. But they had been, had been torn up and thrown into the toilet. And the Buckram fished it out of the toilet and sent it to me. And I pasted them together with scotch tape and saw what the letter contained. It was an order for books. A few days later, they call me, they send me another letter. This one from the ashtray in his apartment. Burned, partly burned in the ashtray. 
Similar letter, carbon copy of another order that he made. So, Brian Lieberman testifies at the trial. He says, no, it's a family, family-owned library. I say, didn't you order books for this library as if it was a community library years after the previous Rebbe passed away? He says, I don't remember that. <laughs> I said, didn't you have copies of orders that you put in for that? I don't know. I don't think so. In Yiddish, of course, translated. Then I say, well, let me show you what I pasted together here, a, a copy of a letter that you sent, the date being a couple of days, a couple of years after the Rebbe died. You sent this letter, didn't you? Oh, I don't remember whether I sent it. Well, didn't you tear up the letter and throw it down the toilet because you wanted to destroy evidence? Oh, no. If, I, if that letter was thrown down the toilet, it was because I was cleaning up my apartment and throwing up papers that I didn't need. I didn't do that to destroy evidence. Oh, Mr. Lieberman, I have another letter here. This was a letter that was burned and was found in your ashtray. Didn't you burn this letter in order to destroy evidence? And here he gives the answer, which appeared in the New York Times, because the New York Times reporter happened to be there that day. But it was a dream for a cross-examining lawyer. I said, didn't you destroy this, burn this letter to destroy the evidence? And Chaim Lieberman says, no. If I wanted to destroy evidence, I would have thrown it down the toilet. <laughs> say, teach you that this trial was not just an ordinary trial. It was a trial which had siyata dishmaya, that had the help of the, the Almighty. Um, the, you know, the The, um, the Rebbe, I've seen from some Sfari, himself talked about the, this week's Sedra by Yigash and what in ways that affected, that when I read it, affected what I thought happened in the trial. When Yehuda says to Yosef, Avdapa Arevis Hanah, so the Rebbe said, Avdava Arevis Anar, because call Yisrael Arevin Zelozeh. Call, that's the message that Yehuda was giving to Yosef on behalf of Binyam. Call Yisrael Arevin. And the Rebbe said, Arevin is a word that not only means guarantee, but it's also from Lushen Masikus, that Ayin Reish Beis also means sweet. Yisrael Misuki said, Jews are sweet to each other. And that's really the lesson also in terms of this case. The Jews who are sweet, the Jews who are Arabian Zelos, are recognized the justice of our position in this litigation. Um, the, again, I could go on for a long time talking about the different things that happened in this trial. I can tell you that now, since in these last 30 years or 28 years since the decision, my wife and I have had the good fortune to travel all over the world, different places, China, India, Hong Kong, uh, locations in Europe. Every place we go, of course, we look up the Chabad Shliach. We're hosted by him. We go to the Chabad house. Everybody loves us because I helped the Rebbe. When the case began, one of the men who was close to the Rebbe and was involved the Rebbe's decision 
that I should handle this case said to me very wisely. He said, Lewin, he says, you better win this case. Because if you don't win this case, there's no place in the world that you can go. Thank you. 